So it's um, it's twelve now, so we'll get started and uh, with introductions and whatever little mm -hmm. housekeeping things we have going. Um, my name is Mary Ann Hooper. I work at Tradition Public Library. Uh, I am a programming person there, and this is our second year of partnering with the Valley Forge Park Alliance for the summertime lunch and learn series, and we are really happy that we're able to continue that this summer uh, through Zoom. Uh, we're welcoming, let's see, oh wow, we're up to 46 participants. That's wonderful. Um, we are recording this, so if you know someone who wanted to see it and is missing it, uh, we have to do a little bit of editing, but aside from that, it will be available. Uh, we look forward to that. Um, I'd like to introduce Molly Duffy with the Valley Forge Park Alliance, and then Russell Brindley will be along to talk about uh, the Caribbean during the American Revolution. So on to Molly. Thanks, Marianne. And I want to thank you and the Tradition Library for hosting our Lunch and Learn again. You did it last year. And actually, we had Russell last year. And it's interesting because we were in your community room, which can only ho hold so many people. And that's not everybody can drive to the Tradition Library. And we have about 50 people today, many more than last year. Um, and I'm guessing that some of you are from far away. So welcome to everybody. And who may not know the Valley Forge Park Alliance. We're the nonprofit partner to Valley Forge National Historical Park. And our mission is to inspire appreciation and support for the park. And so some of the upcoming events that we have are one more lunch and learn, which will be at the end of August. And we are about to announce our virtual speaker series, which will begin on October 8th, which will be via Zoom. And we're also planning a virtual and hopefully live, possibly drive in premiere of Valley Forge Visitor Center's new uh, film, which is very exciting. New film, hasn't been a film since 1976. We're really excited to present that along with the director and the everybody who made it possible in their commentary. Um, let's see, what else? Um, so I, I guess I just wanted to thank you all because members and donors really make all of our work possible. So I wanna thank you for your support and say that if you love Valley Forge Park, one great way to show it is by supporting the Valley Forge Park Alliance. So thanks everyone, thanks for being here. Russell, we're really glad to, to see your presentation. So thanks so much. Thank you. Um, again, I, I wanna thank uh, Molly and the Park Alliance for the continuing support of everything that they do for the park. I also wanna thank Mary Ann and it's a different library again for hosting me and, and Valley Forge and the Park Alliance for, uh, for these lunch and learn programs and their support uh, for, the, uh, for the National Park and for Valley Forge, we appreciate it. Um, without partners, there would be no Valley Forge National Historical Park. And just with all of you watching right now, I think we're at 54 right now. Um, many of you probably know me or, or have been to the park before or many of you this is your first time hearing of Valley Forge. Without you, none of this would be possible. And I want to thank you all for participating and hopefully you enjoy this presentation and learn something new. That's what it's all about. Thank you. So you're, you're joining us a little late. Oh, oh, sorry. Just a quick housekeeping thing that we had mentioned earlier. Um, type your questions into the Q&A and we will address those at the end. Yes. And uh, a welcome to all of our local historical societies who were also invited, uh, King of Prussia, Tradiferin, Radnor, Easttown. So welcome all of you too. Uh, sorry to interrupt, Russell. Off sure. we go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So my name is Russell Brindley. I'm one of the park guides at Valley Forge. Again, welcome to all of you. We appreciate it. So the title of this program, as hopefully you can all see on your screen, is The Caribbean During the American Revolution. There we go. So the outline of this program is going to be broken down into four different parts. One, the role the Caribbean played in, in the colonies before the American Revolution. Two, 
the privateers and their role in the American Revolution itself. Three, the global conflict between France, Spain, the Netherlands, and England. And finally, the legacy of the American Revolution in the Caribbean. When we think of the Caribbean and the West Indies, what comes to mind? A lot of us think of, oh, the Caribbean, we're going on vacation, we're going to the beach, tropical paradise, things like that. Well, the Caribbean was actually a hotbed of activity throughout the eight years of the American Revolution. As you see on this map here, we have, I expanded a little bit um, more than last year, as some of you might have seen this presentation last year, focused more on the Caribbean, but I also wanted to include the Gulf of Mexico as well as their part of the same story as you see here. So in red, we have British control. They control all the 13 colonies. Even during the American Revolution, they're fighting for that survival and, and that hold. They also control the 14th colony, which is Florida. And that consists of East and West Florida. As you see, Baton Rouge from the Mississippi River all the way to St. Augustine, Florida. They control the Bahamas, Jamaica, numerous of the sugar islands in the Leeward and Windward Islands, which is Antigua, Dominique, St. Vincent, Grenada, Barbados, for example, and then two little enclaves in Central, in Central America, British Honduras and the Mosquito Coast. Then, as you see the yellow, it's most of the territory controlled by Spain. So we're talking about all of modern-day Mexico, most of Central America, the southern states of Texas, Louisiana, most of South America, their main island of Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Trinidad, for example. Then you have the French, which don't control as much as the English and the Spanish, but they are still a large power in that. You have San Domingo, Martinique, St. Lucia, Guadalupe, and then finally the Dutch, and their focus, well, my focus on that, is going to be the island of St. Eustatius, as you see right there. Now, most of these islands, before I get back, before I get to that, were volcanic peaks rising from the ocean, sweeping northward from South America. Most of the islands, like I said, were lushly vegetated with tropical rainforests. The distance from one end of the island, the Bahamas, all the way down to Burbice, which is in this South America, is nearly 1,850 miles. So we're talking about a large swath of territory that is going to be the focus of this program and activity during the American Revolution. In the period where most of the British colonies in North America lived less than 200 miles inland, and the major cities were situated along the coast, we're talking about New York, Philadelphia, Boston, Baltimore, for example, the ocean often acted as a highway between the islands in the Caribbean and the mainland rather than a barrier. And they produced a lot of goods that were important to the development of the American colonies and influencing the American Revolution. This trade was called the Triangular Trade, as you see there in a, with our chart here. You had manufacturing goods from Europe being sent to North America and also to parts of Africa. You have rum, sugar, slaves from the Caribbean being sent up by boats to Charleston, Philadelphia, New York, and Boston. Also, you're gonna have thousands of slaves being sent from Africa to the West Indies to work on their sugar plantations, as you see in the bottom here, on slave ships like this. And during the eve of the American Revolution, three quarters of the slave trade that was sent to the 13 colonies directly came from the Caribbean. 1.2 million slaves are estimated to live in the Caribbean during the American Revolution. That is a large swath of people stuck in bondage working on these sugar plantations for the, for the British, for the Spanish, for the Dutch, making this sugar, making this money, and being economic driver for these European powers. Now, during the American Revolution, that trade is going to be vital for the patriotic cause, that connection between the colonies and the Caribbean and and vice versa, it's going to be very profitable, like it has been in the past, and it's going to be very dangerous, as we're going to see. And so you see on this chart here, kind of talk a little bit about the economic power from the trade in the Caribbean with England and France. 
As you see here, just before the American Revolution starts in 1775, English merchants start to hold on to and start to hoard all these goods because there's going to be a war brewing and they fear that there's going to be shortages of trade with armies fighting and ports being closed and they're going to start hoarding that and rationing that and leading to higher prices. Unfortunately, it's kind of parallels of what's happening in today, in today with uh, dirt, with your toilet paper, with your hand sanitizer, you know, it's very hard to come by and if you're trying to find it online, the prices are, you know, astronomical. So it's kind of the same idea here. There's trouble afoot and what, and what they're trying to do is trying to hold on to that and then try to survive the economic downturn during the American Revolution and continue to be profitable. The same thing with France. As you see there, most of their, most of their money is coming from the West Indies, which will eventually become Haiti after the American Revolution. Fortunately, when they declare war on England in 1777 to 78, their exports are going to drastically decrease because those ports are going to be closed because of the British Navy and the French Navy slugging in on the Caribbean. And you see here in this other map that I created a while ago, you can kind of see some of the locations, some of the cities that we still have today. New Orleans is a very important supply hub. Veracruz in Mexico, Carnega in, um, in Venezuela. These are very important ports of bringing in supplies and, and funneling them out in the Caribbean, in the Gulf of Mexico to, to the 13 colonies and also into Europe. And then also you have St. Eustatius, you have dockyards, Havana is maybe a very important dockyard for the Spanish, Kingston in Jamaica, and also in Barbados as well for the British. So while this trade is being affected by the start of the American Revolution, what happens is Congress decides to form a secret committee in 1775 that's going to begin financing and supplying expeditions to the Caribbean. The committee is going to have these ships ship tobacco, grain, indigo, timber as barter for foreign munitions in those French and Dutch and also in some Spanish islands in the Caribbean and also in the Gulf of Mexico. For example, Marconite was considered by the Americans as their chief magazine and asylum in these seas. So that's going to initially play an important role in the beginning of the American Revolution of getting the American army supplies. As you see on the image on the right there, Pierre Beaumarchais, he's most notably known as the author of the Barber of Seville. He's going to create a shell company with the blessing of the French government during the American, in the beginning of the American Revolution and throughout, of called Rodriguez Hortales and Company in Paris. And he's going to co-sign some of his military shipments to that gentleman on the right there, William Bingham. And he's going to represent the Continental of Congress in Marconi. And he's going to support the activities of those privateers coming to that island. And he's going to meet with those commanders at this place called the American Coffee House. Bingham is instructed by Congress to feel the pulse of the French government to know whether it beats towards American independence. And if possible, to proceed and acquire 10,000 muskets well fitted with bayonets for General George Washington's army. During the first two years of the American Revolution, 90% of the gunpowder discharged by the rebels was produced from abroad and primarily stored and shipped out from the Caribbean. For example, in 1777, that island of Marconique from the French control, 235 American vessels sailed to that island getting supplies for the Continental armies. As you see on the next slide here, the Dutch island of St. Eustatius soon became also the region's premier nest of outlaws selling provisions, clothing, and all naval and warlike stores to the rebels and the enemies of Britain. In 1779, seven to 10 ships arrived every day to St. Eustatius, along with regular convoys of French merchant ships. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, what the title talks about there of the British actually raiding and destroying that city. But as you see in the image there, all those buildings that you see right here, those are all warehouses full of goods, of weapons, of clothing, of gunpowder, that those ships sail and support exchange their indigo, rice, tobacco, and get those goods 
sail past the British blockade of the 13 colonies into these small estuary ports and funnel those supplies out as best they could. On November 16, 1776, Fort Orange on the island of St. Eustatia actually fired the first official salute to the American flag of the United States with their brig of the Andrew Dorian. Also, that ship was carrying a copy of the Declaration of Independence to present to the Dutch government to try to convince them to join our cause and fight against one of their nemesis, the English. Privateers. Besides these smugglers, Congress is going to create these, to have these privateers. There are also similar merchant ships going out there, getting goods, but their job is really to be the third element of a nautical triple threat, featuring continental warships from the Continental Navy for ocean combat, mid-sized provincial vessels protecting those coasts, like in Philadelphia, like in New York City, like in Boston, and these privateers are going to go out there and sail, attack, take, and bring into any port all vessels offending and employed by the enemy. So their mission is to attack and destroy British merchant ships and possibly, if they can, British naval ships and get those goods back to American sailors and American soldiers. And that act is actually going to be called the Act of Encouraging and the Fixing Out of Armed Vessels. So there's an official act that con the Continental Congress passes that advertise to anyone who has money with a crew of people, get your ship, go out and sail into the Caribbean, go sail out into the English Channel, go sail out onto the, east, the west coast of Africa, engage in these British merchant ships and British Navy, and bring back the goods. Continental Congress also created, well, actually before I get to that, there were 1,700 letters of Martinique that were issued. These are legal documents for raiding. Anywhere from 1,700 to 3,000 ships were commissioned and over 70,000 privateers served throughout the Revolutionary War. While the Continental Navy was small, it only had about 20 ships, by the way, versus 500 for the British Navy. So it was a little lopsided. That was under the command of Sepp Hopkins, and you see his image right there. He was very successful. Naval commander throughout the Revolutionary War. His most noble deployment in action was in the beginning of the war, was the deployment of the US Marines, first time on foreign soil. They attack and raid very successfully New, New Providence, Nassau, in the Bahamas on March 3rd, 1776. And what they do is they see 78 cannon, a small supply of gunpowder with no casualties except sailor, a couple sailors who fell by too much celebratory drinking. So it was a successful raid. They were able to get those cannons and bring them back again to help out George Washington's army. While this is going on, the British government isn't happy about this. The British government in March of 1777 passes the Pirate Act. That denies due process and prisoner exchange for these captives, committing piracy upon the ships and goods of his majesty's subjects. Throughout the Revolutionary War, 3,000 Americans were captured by the British and thrown into prisons. As you see here, Mill Prison in Southern England, Fort in Prison near uh, Portsmouth, a major British naval dock and supply center. There's also gonna be some prisons for the Americans, privateers in Antigua, St. Augustine as well, Eventually, New York City, Wallabet Bay, which is now where the Brooklyn Navy Yard is. Some of those captured privateers are going to be sent to England. Unfortunately, 3,000 of them are going to serve there. And really, their only means of escape is possibly joining the British Navy as a way to get out. And I have an image of the mill prison there, and you can see that it was a large complex, terrible conditions. They weren't getting as much food. However, if I go back real quick, the prisoners were actually treated a little bit better when they were prisoners in England than in New York and Wallabate Bay. The reason for that is the English did not have to travel four to six weeks 
from England to America with supplies and food and provisions to the British Army and for their captives. While in England, their, the chance of getting goods was much greater to survive. British sympathizers in New York and the West Indies also launched privateers of their own to combat the American privateers. A patriotic merchant wrote, more than half the American vessels that have sailed since the middle of February of 1777 are taken. So now you have American privateers fighting the British Navy and merchant ships, and also you have British privateers and the British Navy going after the privateers and the smugglers trying to capture and destroy those ships in the Caribbean and throughout the world. Damages from the American privateers stood alone at 2 million pounds in the West Indies. So they were very successful at attacking and destroying those ships by the middle of 1777. In the first 18 months of the revolution, that number increased by fivefold. Throughout the revolution, 3,100 ships were captured and destroyed by the privateers. So they were very successful, like I said, in causing damage and hardship for the British. Now, as the American smugglers and privateers increased in the Caribbean, the British, with the British response, more players got involved. And before I get to part three, I just want to kind of talk about, and this relates to part three, as you see here on this chart, eventually as the British enemies eventually join the American Revolution, the British priority of their troops and their navy is going to change dramatically throughout the Revolutionary War. In February 6th of 1778, France officially declare, declares war on England. On June 21st, 1779, Spain declares war on England, the Bourbon powers allied with France. France will officially recognize the United States. Spain will not, but they will continue to trade with them. They just won't officially recognize their independence until after the Revolutionary War. December 20th, 1780, England declares war on the Dutch aka the Netherlands, for their trade and violation of the Neutrality Act. And England was fed up with them in St. Eustatius, providing supplies to the Continental Army and Navy. The defense of the British colony, colonists in the Caribbean was a major priority for the home government. It deflected precious military resources that otherwise have served in America. In October of 1777, England sent 5,000 troops to the Caribbean. Due to the action of the French officially joining the American Revolution in 1778 and eventually Spain in 1779, it actually is related to the Valley Forge story. The British evacuated Philadelphia due to the fact that the British home government was reprioritizing the war effort. The commander at the time period, Henry Clinton, who took over from William Howe, in that year, he was ordered to evacuate Philadelphia, send his troops to New York City, and he had to divert about 3,000 soldiers alone in his army at that time to go down to Jamaica and defend that against the French, and then eventually Spanish. So again, as you see here on the chart, the army in the British Army will increase throughout the Revolutionary War, but as you see on the bottom there, the West Indies forces do increase as well, including troops going to Gibraltar and Mallorca in the Mediterranean Ocean. Same thing with the British Navy. As you see from 1779 to 1782, percentage-wise, in the gray there, so the third line, you only have about 10% of the British Navy in the West Indies. That's going to go up to about 40%. So again, their priorities are changing as the war shifts to different locations and theaters. I want to talk a little bit about something that's going to influence all of this, all these military movements, all these European powers fighting each other. And by the way, if I can just skip real quick here, they're only fighting for over eight islands. Eight islands during the Revolutionary War are going to go back and forth. And you can kind of see them there, Guadalupe, St. Lucius, St. Vincent, Granada, Tobago. So they're fighting only for eight islands while there's Navy actions fighting throughout the Caribbean and in the Gulf of Mexico. Let me go back real quick and talk about hurricanes because hurricanes and the weather are going to play a big role in military engagements in the Caribbean 
and also in the Gulf of Mexico. Travel in the West Indies during the hurricane season from late summer through the late fall was limited. Hurricanes struck the Gulf Coast from Louisiana to Pensacola three successive years. The first of these triple hurricanes happened in October of 1778, just before Spain declared war on Great Britain. On October 18th of 1779, the following year, severe storms lashed out on the New Orleans countryside, disrupting that invasion of taking over of Western Florida from the British until the following year. The main hurricanes are gonna happen between February and July and going into October of 1780. That's gonna be the worst hurricane season during the American Revolution. And some say even to this day. So there were three hurricanes that struck the Caribbean. They did so much damage that the Admiralty actually had to cancel a secret plan to seize Puerto Rico from the Spanish. So it's destroying British naval supplies, ships, personnel, dockyards. So it's disrupting their whole plans to change the war in the British's favor. The Great Hurricane occurred between October 10th and the 11th, and it struck Barbados. You can see right here. That island, striking Barbados, it killed over 4,300 people alone. That island was the bastion of British economic, political, and military power. The toll throughout the Indies reached about 22,000 people from that hurricane alone. British's George Sir Romney was deeply shaken by the disaster at Barbados. He describes it as the midst of this beautiful island in the world as the appearance of a country laid waste by fire and sword and the appearance of the imagination more dreadful than is possibly for me to find words. The storm will eventually lurch into French territory next and sink at least 40 ships of a French convoy off of Martinique with the loss of 5,000 sailors and soldiers. The third hurricane struck between October 18th and the 21st of 1780, just as, the, as Spain's forces were gathering under the command of Bernardo de Galvez. Galvez, Texas is named after him. He was leading a force of 64 warships and 4,000 soldiers to attack and surprise the British garrison at Pensacola, which was a major British naval base in the Gulf of Mexico and in Western Florida. The storm caused so much damage that they had to return to Havana to fix their ships and they had to call off the attack until the following year. So you can see here in some images that I was able to find, you can see the destruction of these hurricanes, for example, destroyed the HMS Hector and the HMS Bristol in the Great Hurricane of 1780s. So it's just destroying warships that take years to make that have crews of hundreds of soldiers on them. It's destroying the mills, the plantations that are providing the economic engine to fund the war for the Spanish, for the French, for the Dutch, and for the British. As you see there, is an example of destroying of a grist mill in uh, Barbados. So it's total destruction with these hurricanes in 1780. Completely disrupts the whole war effort for these countries. And so you see in this map here, again, they're fighting for pretty much control of just eight islands back and forth throughout the Revolutionary War. They're gonna ex exchange hands numerous times. They're also fighting in Western Florida, as you see there, the Spanish slowly take over Baton Rouge, Mobile, another port city, eventually Pensacola. The, 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 the Spanish at the end of the Revolutionary War briefly take over Nassau, just like the United States Marines did in the beginning of the war. You're also gonna have the British trying to divide up the Spanish Empire by sailing up the San Juan River and trying to divide up the empire and, and expand their holdings along the Mosquito Coast and British Honduras. So it's, they're fighting all over the place. Just a little bit more of a zoom in here of some of those islands that we're talking about, Grenada, St. Vincent falls to the, uh, to the French, St. Lucia returns to the fold for the British after taking it back from the French. So they're fighting back and forth, like I said. The invasion of Dominique, for example, as you see here, September 7th, 1778, the French with 3,000 soldiers take out a garrison of only a couple hundred soldiers. So there are some islands that are just decimated due to tropical diseases, the British army being stretched thin, fighting with 
slave insurrections and native populations that are still there trying to get their freedom and their independence. So it's very complicated and it's very, it's very hard for these British commanders to figure out what is the best course of action in the Caribbean. Another example, Grenada, as you see there, the French successfully take that over on July 4th of 1779, decimating the British forces there. San Juan expedition, as you see, we have a young Horatio Nelson there. He's in, she's a military commander. He's in charge of about 3,000 soldiers during that expedition. You have Galvez's father, who's going to be the Spanish commander in charge of defending and making sure the British don't divide up their empire with the British holdings. Luckily for the Spanish, malaria sets in with the mosquitoes and the and the weather and it decimates the British forces just like it did in the Seven Years War when the British sieged and was trying to take Havana in Cuba from the Spanish. So eventually Horatio Nelson gets very ill, has to leave his forces, goes recuperates and survives in Jamaica while he loses about half his soldiers due to disease and the British forfeit that expedition in 1780. Siege of Pensacola. So you have Bernardo de Galvez, the son. And he's very successful of taking out the British forces and making sure that Spain falls back into control for, I'm sorry, making sure that Florida falls back into control for the Spanish Empire, just like it did before the American Revolution. And you see there, Spanish. Eventually, they're also going to have the French. French are going to send a small force to actually help them in a joint effort to work and take out close to 2,000 soldiers under General Campbell, controlled by the British. One of the most important battles during the Caribbean is going to be between the French naval commander, de Grasse, versus George Romney. And Romney is a very controversial figure in the British history because he attacks, as you saw before, if I can go back real quick, and I apologize for going back a little too much here. Let's see if I can find it. St. Eustatius. So British Rom the British commander, George Romney, will attack and raid and capture St. Eustatius from the Dutch and bring it into British control. However, he will fly the false flag. He will fly the Dutch flag and convince all these privateers and Dutch ships and French convoy ships to come into St. Eustatius to be surprised that the British Navy is there and they get to capture those, those ships and those goods. Romney does stuff his pockets because he is in debt throughout the Revolutionary War. He's a gambler, unfortunately, and he has a lot of bills to pay. And unfortunately, he sends his notes, his subordinate, to engage in de Grasse's fleet after the Battle of the Capes in 1781. Unfortunately, Romney doesn't send all his forces because he's still pillaging and plundering St. Eustatius. And eventually the French were able to drive off the British reinforcements back to New York City that led to the British surrender at Yorktown. If it wasn't for St. Eustatius and, and George Romney staying there, the Battle of Yorktown might have not happened the British might have evacuated and the war could have continued. Now with the Battle of the Saints that happens the following year on April 12th, the French are pretty much steamrolling over the British holdings in the Leeward Islands. They are taking over most of the islands except for Barbados, St. Lucius, Antigua, St. Eustatius, but they pretty much control everything else. And so what happens is De Grasse is, is going to rendezvous with the Spanish fleet and they're going, their main job is actually going to invade Jamaica. And if they take out Jamaica, the British holdings in the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico is going to be over. There's going to be nothing left for the British to control there and the whole war is going to be completely changed. However, Romney was able to see the French fleet before it hooked up with the Spanish and was able to break their line. And what do I mean by that is, usually what happens is naval, in naval warfare during this time period, you have both ships lining up and just shooting side by side. 
and then eventually possibly rotating and, and using the other side of the ship and firing that way. The wind direction was a little off and Romney decides, you know what, instead of just focusing our fire on one side, let's hit the French ships on both sides simultaneously. So he's going to break the line as you see on the, or on the second image there. And so his fleet is going to sail right in between the French fleet and decimate the Grass's fleet, eventually actually even capturing that hero and holding him as prisoner of war until the end of the American Revolution. That decimates the French's fleet. And you can see here, again. And with that, the whole war is going to actually change. Because of the French fleet being decimated, the English government is actually going to use that as a bargaining chip to actually convince the French government to eventually take back, and uh, I should say, give back some of those territories that they captured from the British. And so they're going to gain back most of their territory that they lost at the beginning of the American Revolution. So it's pretty interesting that it pretty much goes back to the way it was. Now at this image here, it's a little hard to see, and I apologize um, to some of you are having difficulty with this. It's just another close-up of the Linward, Leeward and Linward Islands. And these are just some of the naval engagements that are taking place. There's dozens of them between Romney, Hood, who's a British commander, versus de Grasse and some of these other French naval commanders. So they're fighting, again, all along the Caribbean, numerous naval battles, some of them very decisive, like the Battle of the Saints, some of them not at all, where only a couple ships are damaged, and then they go sail back to port and they have to figure out what's going on. So now in 1783, what happens is, as I mentioned, the Spanish and the forces, piece by piece, take over more of the British holdings, but like I said, the Bahamas for the Spanish, briefly, all of Florida, eventually. What happens is in 1783, they eventually decide we need peace. So each of these European powers is going to decide to sign separate peace treaties. And you can see here on the map of 1783, Spain takes over all of Florida. They give back control of the Bahamas. On those islands there, pretty much everything is the same. The only thing that's different is Tobago, initially in the beginning of the American Revolution, was under the control of the British. The French have it now. So the activities of the privateers overall and the fleets fighting led to rise in prices and shortages of supplies. This caused, again, disruption in trade, increased insurance charges, higher freight rates, convoy delays, and severe financial losses for many individuals. King George III thought it was better to risk an invasion of England than to lose a sugar island. And without it, it was impossible to raise money to continue the war. Again, the British strategy placed defense of Jamaica second only to domestic security, and it gave priority over America. So, like I said before, these sugar islands are money makers for these European powers, and England is doing the best they can to hold on to them by pretty much reprioritizing the war, including in America. So you see here, General Gage, before he was replaced in 1775, he's giving advice to the British government. He's saying, if you think 10,000 men is enough to crush this revolution, it's not, you need to send 20. If you think 2 million pounds is enough, you need to send 4 million. And so what happens is the money and the expenditures of fighting these wars, not just in, in America, not just in the Caribbean, in the Gulf of Mexico, they're also fighting, like I briefly said, in the English Channel, North Sea, they're fighting in Gibraltar, they're fighting in South Africa, they're fighting in India. So this, uh, this war for the British and for the French, even for the Americans, is just going to increase dramatic, just exponentially. And it's going to be really detrimental to these countries, especially France, after the American Revolution. It's going to lead to the bankruptcy and eventually to the French Revolution. So you see there, 48% increase with naval spending and military spending alone in 1782, as the war ratchets up between England, France, and Spain. Between 1777 and 1779, the British lost about 15,000 soldiers in the Western Atlantic, 
John was actually shrinking in the Western Atlantic. In the four years after the Battle of Saratoga, General Clinton, who's the main military commander, only has received about 4,700 reinforcements for the, for, from Britain to make up the loss of close to 19,000 soldiers. Furthermore, his naval support, like we saw in those other charts before, is reducing to favor for the Caribbean. Throughout the, the conflict, over 60,000 loyalists fleeing, fearing their safety, fled the 13 colonies for other parts of the empire, including going to the Caribbean, especially the Bahamas, Jamaica, and Barbados. Without the 13 colonies and the European connection, there would be no successful American revolution. Again, the Caribbean played an important role in getting supplies, we're talking about weapons and gunpowder, it connected the Patriots to the outside world by interacting with eventually European allies, like the Dutch, the Spanish, and the French. Each of these world powers, when they were dragged into the conflict, it forced the British to change their priorities, and it led to them just losing their initiative to fight the main continental army under George Washington to a point where it failed to protect and, lay, and led to the main surrender of the British army at Yorktown in 1781. So again, priorities are changing. It's like that old expression, the British have a bigger fish to fry and it isn't George Washington and the Continental Army. It's the Spanish and the French and the lesser extent, the Dutch. So again, the Caribbean saved the American Revolution. Thank you for your time. If you have any questions, please let me know. And just the last slides are just some resources that I, that I used. If you saw this program last year, I only had like a couple and based on doing a lot more research the last over the last year, I got a lot more. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, Russell. Oh, you're uh, very welcome. If you have questions, please type them into the uh, Q and A down at the bottom. Um, will the PowerPoint be available for download? I know I'm recording the presentation, and that will be available. Um, yes, I can. I can. Um, I can, uh, I will uh, send them my, um, I can give you my uh, email and um, my government email and I can always email them uh, the PowerPoint, absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions? I don't see any other questions. Uh, Russell, thank you very much. Oh, you're very welcome. No problem at all. All right. And thanks to everybody for attending. Um, I never realized the importance of the Caribbean. Uh, just always thought that, uh, you know, the colonies were the be all and the end all. It was, in it's incredible mm -hmm. when you look at the rest of the world, how involved everything really was. Yeah, there's a lot of good. Uh, there's a lot of good books that I list at the end of my PowerPoint here that could give everyone a different perspective on uh, the American Revolution. Like I said, it's not just the end all be all us. It's it's a bigger it's a bigger conflict out there. And I bet you, your library probably has a couple of them. <laughs> I, I bet we do, or we can get them. Mm -hmm. um, a question did pop up: Which three islands did the Tories go to at the end of the American Revolution? Oh, sure. So let me look here. So if we go back, can we go back? I think we can go back here. So the Bahamas, Jamaica, and Barbados. Those were the three that a large percentage of those 60,000 who fled. A lot of them also went to England to be refugees there. And there was tension between people who were already living there and these British citizens who were coming back, who some of them were not even born in England. They were born in the 13 colonies. And so there was a lot of tension as well. Um, also, a lot of them went to um, Halifax, Nova Scotia, and Canada as well. But those are the three uh, for, the, for the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico, the Bahamas, Jamaica, and Barbados. Um, another question. What is the number one item smuggled through the islands to help the Americans? Oh, um, it's going to, I would say it's going to be a combination of gunpowder. Um, the colonists aren't really making gunpowder at this time. There's, there's very small collections of it in British um, garrisons and, and, and forts that the Americans take over. 
that, the, that they're able to, to get, but it doesn't last very long. So gunpowder and, and, and weapons, gun um, muskets, muskets, cannons, um, cartridge boxes, things like that, that are being sent over from the Netherlands, from France, and from Northern Spain. If I can go back real quick here, there's another map that I made a while ago. Apologize. <laughs> of, there we go. So some of those places um, in Northern Spain, Nate, Charleville, they're making all these guns and weapons for the French Navy, for the French Army, and they're eventually funneling them over. So those are the two things. Eventually what's going to happen is a lot of when the French Navy officially gets involved and the British are fighting them in the Caribbean, the ports, the blockade in the 13 colonies is going to, is, is going to fall apart even more so than it already has. And the French ships on the on your um, Beaumarche and the Rogers Fort Tallison Company, they're going to actually send ships to Portsmouth in New Hampshire and they're actually going to go directly to the colonies themselves. But there's still going to be a lot of smuggling from the Caribbean to the colonies throughout the Revolutionary War. Okay. Um, anything else? Other questions? Okay. Um, thanks so much for joining us for Lunch and Learn. Um, keep an eye out for the August Lunch and Learn and then the upcoming fall programs. Um, we're excited to continue programming um, even though we're not together in one place and uh, we still have a lot of uh, a lot of people joining us and it's great to see. Russell, thank you. It was the thank expanded you. edition was wonderful. Oh, uh, thanks so God. much. And thanks to Molly for for helping to put this all together. Yeah, thank you both. I really appreciate the opportunity and thank you all for participating. Thank you. All right. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.